Good evening and welcome to the August 26, 2013 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carol, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Buffard? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Paul? Here. Mr. Thomas? Here. Uh, before I move on, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our newest member, Mr. McGee. Good evening. Thank you. Welcome to the board. Um, Mr. McGee is now our second alternate, which moves uh, John into our first alternate's position. So... And since we do have a full complement this evening of the board, the normal five members will be the voting members this evening unless somebody recuses themselves. With that, uh, the other thing I'd like to say before we get going <clears throat> is that Bailey Seafood Restaurant, Stan Bailey requests an amended site plan review for a 1,088 square foot addition at 165 Pine Point Road has been withdrawn. So. We will not be uh, listening to that this evening. And with that, I would uh, move on to our next item on the agenda, which is the approval of minutes of August 5th, 2013. Is there a motion? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? I was not here. Withdraw, uh, with, uh, with stay, or abstain? Yep. And we have two of those. So, <coughs> show that to be moved forward, though. Our next item on the agenda this evening. Item number five, Rosvera Family Development, LLC, requests a site inventory and analysis and master plan review for a 40,000 square foot mixed use building at One Foley Farm Road. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this project is before the board. Um, you had sketch plan, I think, at your last meeting <coughs> before you, again, for plan development review, which is the um, inventory and master planning step. And it's um, before you for plan development review because what's proposed is larger um, the square footage of the building at 40,000 <coughs> square feet is larger than is typically allowed in the TVC district. Uh, the conventional or typical limitation on building size is 20,000 square feet. Um, but in the TVC zone, there's the plan development review process that provides for some flexibility, some creativity in development design and building size. Um, if applicants go through the plan development review process, meet the standards um, in the zone, and um, design the project in a way that reinforces the goals for Oak Hill and the TVC. Um, so sort of building size, as it, how it relates to the street, um, how it's designed with, in this case, multiple stories all play a role in your design of um, the project. Staff provided um, some comments to you, both on the site inventory analysis and master plan. And we also provided uh, a concept of what a neighboring property is thinking about doing um, and felt that it might be helpful as the board and the applicant um, consider the design of this property. There's um, a property which is an extension of um, the Little Dolphin Plaza. Currently it's, it's undeveloped and the applicant uh, I think shared an acquisition of some of that land um, and it's just adjacent to uh, this site. We'll be sharing some roadways. Um, so. Hopefully that layout can help the board in its decision making on um, your master plan review of this particular project. Um, as I mentioned, in, in the plan development review process, there's some goals that I think this project is certainly achieving. So providing a two-story building, which is um, a goal for the TVC zone. Um, they're proposing some sidewalks and some landscaping, et cetera. Um, so those things are certainly being achieved with this design. Um, one area that the board might want to continue to discuss is the building and its uh, relationship to the access road or the roads that provide uh, access to the site. Um, but typical or the conventional zoning on roads like this expect the building to be right up at the street. 
Um, I know the proposal is to, to put the building in the, the middle of the site um, to provide uh, parking on, on three sides, um, which could be found to be um, per the TVC zone if the board's comfortable with that and, and thinks that it meets the goals of the zone. Um, there could be some other ways of meeting the TVC goals by maybe so having some on-street parking on the access road and pushing the building closer to that roadway or, or orienting the building a little bit differently um, to lessen the, the front yard parking. Um, beyond that, a few other considerations for master plan and, and as the project moves into site plan um, is the opportunities for reducing the curb cuts or sharing the curb cuts, um, perhaps with the Dimitri site off a little Dolphin Way or Drive, as well as just a general discussion on um, how the, the two access roads into the site um, are going to be upgraded in order for the town to accept them as public streets and, and what those upgrades might be. Um, I don't know that that needs all to be worked out at the master plan stage, but before site plan approval, um, more engineering and, and discussion should be had as to the width of those roads, um, sidewalks, and um, whether on-street parking might be appropriate, et cetera. So, um, and those were outlined in staff comments. So at this point, those are some introductory remarks, and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. And we welcome the applicant this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair, St. Clair Associates. I have tonight with me Rafi Rizbera and Bill Rizbera of Rizbera Family Development. We have a slideshow presentation for you tonight. It's based on the information that you have in your packet. We've taken the drawings that are uh, sort of more of a black and white in your packet and added some color, hopefully, to help uh, ease us through the uh, review process with the discussion about the site inventory and analysis in the master planning. We've broken our slide presentation into two parts, so we'll talk about the site inventory and analysis and take a pause and, and let you folks uh, discuss that item. And then, uh, as we discussed at our last meeting, we'd like to also combine the master planning phase uh, as part of this review. So we have some more detailed information uh, for sort of the next step uh, in the process. So when we get to sort of the breaking point, there is more information that's coming, uh, but hopefully this will help you uh, in the review process. I have the... Uh, first slide that's up is the locust map, and that is based on the aerial uh, that is, uh, available for this area. And on that location map, you can see we've highlighted in yellow the site. Uh, it's a 1.99 acre site, and as we discussed at the sketch plan review at the last meeting, <coughs> excuse me, this is actually a portion uh, of the Gendron piece, uh, and it was split between uh, the applicant and the abutter. Uh, in order to allow both entities to use this area uh, as part of their future plans. So we are located in the TVC district. As Dan had discussed, we are here before you tonight as part of the plan development review. Uh, although the site itself is not of a size that would trigger this type of review, the building as a one-tenant, 40,000-square-foot building does trigger this type of review. Uh, and so we've prepared some information for you uh, with regard to that. As you can see on the plan, we have frontage on three points uh, on this uh, site. We have Foley Farm Road, uh, has 245 feet of frontage. Uh, the access road has 340, and the Little Dolphin Drive has 134, which is the least uh, amount of frontage on this piece. What makes this piece unique as well, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, is the fact that it does have visibility, high visibility from Route 1, so we don't want to neglect that piece uh, of the puzzle. So as we go through this process and we look at the site inventory plan, part of the information that we look at is what are the existing conditions on the site. As I mentioned, this was the Gendron parcel. They had a home on the property as well as a garage and a couple of outbuildings. The <coughs> excuse me. The uh, abutting land uses in the area are a range of retail. Uh, there's a branch bank nearby, uh, restaurants, offices, 
those types of uses, which are all compatible with the proposed use that we have uh, set aside for the site. The uh, property itself, if you look at the next sort of layer of information uh, with regard to soils and natural resources, there are basically two map soil types on the site. Both of them are very supportive of uh, development. They are in the A and B soil classes, which from a runoff perspective are essentially the more absorbent soils. Uh, so we're dealing with a situation where uh, the site development itself, from a soil standpoint, seems conducive to use of the site for a commercial property. There are a couple of wetland areas that were identified as part of Mark Hampton's evaluation of the site. You can see those in the sort of <coughs> upper edge on the easterly edge of the site uh, near Little Dolphin Drive. Those two wetland areas are adjacent to where there is an access drive for the driveway for the house that uh, exists on the property. Uh, so we would be, as part of our plan, incorporating our entrance in that location to help reduce potential wetland impacts associated with that. I do want to note that there is a, a wetland pocket that's on what would be the extension of Little Dolphin Drive, which would also be included uh, as part of the review with a design for the extension for Little Dolphin Drive and the connector road uh, as it goes through. One of the other elements in our discussion, and we have uh, quite a bit of this information already outlined in the narrative uh, that we submitted to you as part of our application, but a couple of things that we talk about as part of the evaluation of the property is sort of where does it fit in the context from a transportation and circulation standpoint. And one of the things that this property was lacking was a looped connector, an internal connector. And so as part of that sort of foundation of looking at development of the site, the um, proposed connector road uh, is part of the program. And that's a very valuable and key aspect of bringing this site to life, uh, is being able to create that sort of looped flow, that internal network that helps build the stability in the Oak Hill area, allows people to move about without having to get out uh, onto Route 1. Uh, there are three points of access to the major road system already. Uh, the intersection with Little Dolphin Drive and Route 1, which is the uppermost little orange dot. Uh, the lower intersection is the intersection between Hannaford Drive and Foley Farm Road. Foley Farm Road is a private roadway currently as part of the agreements in moving forward. The segment between the connector road and Hannaford Drive would be offered for public acceptance, so that's part of the whole network uh, that would be done. The yellow dot that's near the margin of the plan is the signalized intersection with Route 1 and Hannaford Drive. So that does give a good opportunity <coughs> to get into the road network, the existing road network gives some opportunities to travel on Hannaford Drive in both directions, hopefully alleviating some of the congestion at the open <coughs> intersection. When we talk about the site, as we mentioned, the site has three locations that have frontage, but it does have that Route 1 visibility, which is highlighted in the yellow box there. The uh, utilities that are in the area are generally reasonably available. There are some extensions that would have to happen to come up into this site, uh, but for the most part in the Oak Hill area, utilities are here. We would anticipate that as part of a phase one development, depending on timing, we may have to have a propane tank, but uh, we're looking to have gas extended to the area so that that would be part of a future phase if the timing doesn't work out for the exact phase one. Uh, but other than that, we're talking about pretty straightforward utility extensions up into the site. The uh, power for the house actually comes in off of Foley Farm Road. There's a transformer that's on the site. I think, Dan, one of your comments was that power was shown from both directions. At this point, we're not 100% uh, sure on whether a redundant power supply will be needed for the user. Uh, if that's the case, then that loop would be available. Uh, but either <coughs> or, um, we would be able to have access uh, for the site for um, power. So <coughs> one of the other things that we, we like to look at as part of this phase is stormwater management and what are options and what are issues associated with that. As I mentioned, the site is the A and B soil categories. So we've got a, a situation where the volume of runoff is going to be somewhat less than some other sites which may be in the C or D categories. 
We do anticipate that we will be using best management practices as part of the site development, that we'll be incorporating landscaped areas and trying to fit it as best we can into the landform so that we don't have a large pond area or something that's sort of not in keeping uh, as part of the whole program. One of the things you'll also see on that plan is the sort of the sidewalk connector, the pedestrian linkage in the site. We really feel good about this property in that with the connector access, with the connector road and the, the, the resource that's coming to this project, that the ability to enhance the pedestrian network in this area will be uh, very much benefited by this type of project. The site itself will have its own internal sidewalks. We do anticipate that as part of phase one, that sidewalk would be extended down uh, on uh, Little Dolphin Drive to access to Route 1, and that as part of the second phase of the project, we would provide a linkage via Foley Farm Road to connect in to the sidewalks that are along Hannaford Drive and in the shopping centers that are out there. Um, there is no sidewalk right now on either of those roadways, uh, so those would be upgrades and improvements that would need to happen uh, as part of the future development uh, moving forward here. So <coughs> moving on to sort of the, the next phase of the, the project, we spent quite a bit of time in our discussions with you in the site inventory and analysis narrative that we, we provided, <coughs> talking about the uh, site opportunities, the site constraints, et cetera. Um, as we sort of breezed over <laughs> in the slide presentation, the existing site conditions are conducive to development. Uh, it's generally flat site, it's um, good soil conditions, good setting. We're in a situation where if you look at the, the uh, image there on the, the board, you'll see that the TVC district extends a fair amount back away from the site. So we are nestled right in the TVC district. So noise receptors, sensitive residential areas, those types of things, we're sort of in amongst conducive uh, development, supportive and, and compatible. Uh, with what we are proposing. Uh, as you know from our discussion at the last meeting, what we are proposing is a single office type use. Um, we're looking at a home campus for a major area employer. And as part of that, we feel that this is a very nice attribute uh, for the Oak Hill area because it brings people. It brings people who will be here on a daily basis. They'll be here throughout the day and they will have opportunities during breaks and lunch time and before and after work to uh, patronize all of the businesses that are there uh, in the Oak Hill area that have already been set up uh, already. So the zoning and adjacent uses are complementary to our proposed use. The natural resources and the soils on the site don't pose any uh, significant constraints uh, to our, our project. Utilities are reasonably available in the area. As we mentioned, we do want to incorporate low impactors, stormwater VMPs on the site, integrate them into uh, the plan so that it's a very tall, it's a very small site, it's a very tight site. And so what we want to do is integrate elements that treat the stormwater and are fit into the landform so that they can have a double duty. They can provide some additional aesthetic benefits as well as some more utility uh, type benefits with stormwater. The access limitations, as I mentioned, we are very confident that the proposed connector road will access will provide uh, an answer and a solution to the access limitations uh, that are there on the site. And the high visibility of this site, where it's got four very prominent views, uh, is, is key <coughs> to the development of the design of the building. Uh, and its placement on site as evidenced by some of the comments that we've received from you folks already. Um, I think the biggest thing that we really need to keep in mind is the fact that the biggest attribute <coughs> is to bringing people to an area where they can walk, where they can be here on a daily basis, a substantive mass for folks to be able to enjoy and use the businesses that are already here in the Oak Hill District. Uh, and so we're confident that this will be definitely an attribute to the overall district. So I'm back to the location map, just sort of an overview, gives you an aerial, uh, sort of a presentation as to where we fit into the landform, talk a little bit about that. And at this point, if there's anything that you folks have any questions on with regards stri strictly to the <coughs> inventory and analysis, then we can talk a little bit about that. 
Uh, and as I said, we do have additional information on the master plan phase. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I will ask the board if there's any questions that they have regarding the site inventory piece. Mr. Mazur, do you want to get us rolling here? Uh, yeah. Um, as far as the site analysis, Nancy, have the entities, because you, you say that uh, certain things are going to come in from uh, the uh, Little Dolphin Drive and other utilities are going to come in from uh, the uh, Foley Road. Have those entities been approached? And As part of the, the split of the Genrin parcel, there was an agreement put in place that the road would be extended, that the utilities would be extended, that those extensions would happen and would be part of the, the overall benefit to all parties. So yes, it's all part of the discussion. The formal detailed <coughs> designs haven't been presented to the water district and the sanitary district and all that, and you folks as well. But um, the overall program to extend utilities, to bring utilities to that area, has all been part of that original planning. And, and I, I'm a little confused. That's what I was talking to Jay about. It, it appears from the diagrams that the owner of the Little Dolphin Marketplace has a lot more land than the Vesparas from this diagram. That's what it appears to me, and that's what confused me. And has there been a discussion of who's going to be responsible for utilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, between the two entities? Well, first of all, we can... In the master plan phase, we'll talk a little bit about that plan that you have there. We have everything sort of all put together. And I think Rocky was just stepping up to kind of talk about the, the land agreement. So. Good evening. Rocky Risperra. Um, as part of uh, the way the land was purchased, uh, there's a formal agreement uh, that, that all parties have signed. The Foley's are in agreement. Uh, Steve Bryan is in agreement. And my brothers and I are in agreement on... Um, Utilities are going to come from both directions. It's our responsibility, ours being my brothers and I, responsibility to bring utilities from Little Dolphin Drive through the connector road to the Foley's. Um, and most of the utilities, correct me if I'm wrong, Nancy, are going to come from that direction. There's power coming from both directions, and exactly what's going to happen with that, we're not sure. It depends on needs. Uh, but there is a formal uh, agreement in place that, that is enforceable. Thank you. That's all I have now before we get into the next phase. All right, thanks, Ron. I'm all set. Yeah, same here. All set. Dave? John? All set. Nicholas? All set. I as well. At this point, I'm more interested really in what's happening with the master plan and some of the things we're going to be doing with that piece of it, but I think in terms of the actual inventory itself, I think that's fairly straightforward as to what your approach is. So. Having said that, let's keep going. Well, as you see, not much changed on that except the word master plan. <laughs> as part of the um, sort of program, one of the things that you have to look at in a master plan is where, where do you fit in the overall context of landform? What uh, opportunities might you have and how do you, as uh, your own small 1.99 acre site sort of fit into the program. So we wanted to start back right with the, the aerial photo again and sort of talk about, again, the points of access, the visibility, those types of things that we just discussed as part of the site inventory analysis. And this slide here just shows a sort of a sampling of four different concepts that evolved as part of the review. The plan that uh, we have presented to you as part of sketch, and you'll see tonight, is actually sketch number 18. And the plans that you see for here range from, I think the earliest one is number 7, and the later one is number 16. But they show a general sort of program as to what we were looking at and looking at different alternatives. And I do apologize, the smaller one was very hard to get into this slide for some reason, so do forgive me for that. But the basic premise was we were looking at alternatives for the site that would provide, in general, two buildings. Those two buildings would provide an opportunity for perhaps some mixed use 
uh, perhaps some retail opportunities. Remember, this was early on in the process, and we looked at a, a variety of different types of uses. Some of those buildings are situated up near the corners, up near the intersection, set on the minimum yard setbacks, uh, as identified uh, as part of the TVC district. With the incorporation of the, these plans, all of these plans actually would, yep, all of them would actually meet the standards in the TVC district and not require, for a conventional review, I should say, and not require a plan development review. So um, these concepts were pre prepared sort of in the traditional site plan uh, approach. The first smaller one that you see in the upper corner, as I said, was sketch number seven. Uh, the two buildings were situated basically on the corners of the site, and what you end up with is sort of a mass of parking in between them. Uh, and it really sort of created a, just by the virtue of the shape of this site, created a fairly substantive uh, paved area that sort of separated the two buildings. As you go on to the next one, if you're going clockwise around, you'll see that we looked at sort of an L-shaped building that looked at orientation to take advantage of the angle that's in the property line and placed the other building on the front yard, minimum front yard setback of Foley Farm Road. On that particular plan, we did have the similar points of access as we have uh, on our two plans. In that particular case, you end up with sort of an odd-shaped parking area down the middle, um, but it does begin to sort of break up that mass of parking. The next one down, if you're going clockwise, uh, is actually a plan that we presented to you back when we first talked to you folks, and that was one of the plans that came forward with uh, an actual connector, overhead connector, and a drive-through uh, between the two pods of the building. That was subsequently eliminated uh, when the tenant came forward and said they'd like to have the entire building uh, and didn't want to have a drive-through, wanted to have that area be part of their architectural element, uh, which was the atrium area. The plan that is on the, the lower end, the lower left, um, is a, is actually predates the one we just talked about. And that plan does show the building up against uh, Foley Farm Road and uh, the other one placed against um, the access drive. What happens is we get to a situation where we're relatively inefficient with our parking layout. You can see there's a lot of single loaded parking, uh, which ends up being a having to construct a drive aisle and not really getting the full benefit of the use of parking uh, on either side of it. So those are some of the 18 concepts uh, that we went through uh, as part of the process. One of the concepts that we talked about at the sketch plan review was the one that I think some of you folks had alluded that you'd like to see uh, was sketch plan 16. And sketch plan 16 takes the building uh, that the uh, prospective tenants want to have uh, as part of their uh, program and sets it on the 15-foot setback, the minimum setback um, from the access road. We've also tucked it up in the corner adjacent to uh, the intersection with Foley Farm Road uh, and the access road. To slide it the other way on that plan precludes access off of Little Dolphin Drive and would preclude access off of the access road. Uh, just because of the way that the building would be sited and the need to have an, a driveway entrance proximate to the intersection with Foley Farm Road uh, and the access road. Some of the detriments to this type of a layout are, as I highlighted here on the plan, the courtyard area, which is a very key element that we'll talk about uh, as part of the building architecture and design and the, the ultimate site plan, is really put on the, the footprint of the, the access road. As you know, if you've looked at the marketing information for the adjacent site, there are some um, pretty extensive plans that are envisioned for that area. And we do anticipate that the access road will be heavily used uh, as a connector. So to place a courtyard area where employees had a vision for an open space, a space where they could spend time sitting it on an active road is something that is a detriment to that particular layout. It, as you know, we've talked about the fact that the building atrium area has two identical points of access uh, to the building, one on either side of the atrium. With this type of layout, because we are talking about a use where the, um, it's an employee parking uh, there, your employees are coming and going out of one uh, building 
uh, to and from their vehicles. 109 parking spaces, the concept that we uh, have presented to you folks is 119, so we're at a deficit <coughs> of 10 parking spaces uh, in order to provide uh, sufficient, ins well, this one is insufficient parking uh, for the tenant needs. And the way this is laid out, the way that the lot is shaped, et cetera, although we're sitting right on the 15-foot setback, we are at 10 feet off the edge of property line on the uh, southerly side of the site, the side towards Route 1. We have an expanse of pavement that's unbroken, uh, unbroken which is 127 feet. That's two drive aisle bays and the sidewalk right up to the building. Uh, so we, although we do have a couple of small islands in there, we really have a fairly extensive amount of pavement, and that's the visible view from <coughs> Route 1. So for those reasons, uh, we have had eliminated back, as I mentioned, we're at 18 now. Uh, this was at 16, but I did want to present that to you folks because I think that was one of the ideas that uh, had been tossed about uh, at the last meeting, and I wanted to show you visually why we had eliminated that from the program. The plan and elevations that you saw last time, this is just the same image, and don't try to find any difference between the north and south uh, elevations because it's the same. Um, what we wanted to show as part of this slide is architecturally there really isn't a front or a back to this building. Because of the high visibility, the images are identical so that if you're on Route 1, you see the same as if you were traveling along the access drive. And in meeting with the prospective tenant, that is one of the key things that they found as an attribute to the building was the fact that there really was never a backside of the building. So <coughs> the plan that we presented to you folks uh, last time, this is very similar to that plan. Really the only changes that we've added are the inset that shows you sort of the view of the building, the front uh, elevation on both sides, and the courtyard area, which the courtyard itself was something that has been further discussed with the prospective tenant uh, as of last week, and sort of fleshing out the idea of the atrium, its uses, how the uses in the area external to the atrium could be brought internal, uh, and vice versa. So they envision the courtyard area as a pleasant place for their employees to come and go, uh, to have some tables or benches or opportunities to enjoy the outdoors with the atrium, the glazing, sort of bringing the outdoors in. Uh, so really the, the sense of place that we've talked about a little bit uh, in the, the village feel. One of the things that uh, we also wanted to address was part of the concept of uh, on-street parking. And I know that there's been uh, quite a bit of, of comment made about that, and we certainly do understand uh, in the town and village center that on-street parking has its definite benefits and its definite appropriate um, placement. With the siting of this building, with the type of parking that's necessary for this building, when we're talking about employees who will be here throughout the day, we're not talking about shops or things like that, but there's a relatively high turnover of parking, we are anticipating that internal on-site parking would be the most appropriate to meet the needs for this building. That does not say that along the access road at some point in the future, on-street parking might be a benefit to the whole area. So one of the things that we would like to sort of discuss with you folks is that comment, but sort of looking at it in the larger context. So one of the next things uh, that we have is this is the site plan that we just saw, and it's projected onto uh, the aerial overlay uh, for the location. We focused in on this site so you can see how the building is oriented to Route 1, how the points of access tie into the existing road network, and how the connector drive ties in uh, with Little Dolphin and Foley Farm Road. We feel that the layout itself with the building, although it's not perhaps to the, to the letter of the uh, ordinance comments with regard to building placement, we really feel that given this particular site, given this particular use, the placement of the building uh, with its sort of breaking of the massing of parking, giving employees an opportunity to have a shorter uh, path to get to the building. They will have access to both sides. There is no front or back. Um, we feel that this is an appropriate layout uh, for this site. The next slide is 
putting the pieces together. And the image that you folks have in your packet is, I believe, from our marketing plan that was put together for the adjacent <coughs> property. I want to let everybody know and caution everybody that this is a preliminary marketing plan and we have no idea uh, what ultimately will be on that property. But sort of putting everything to scale into context, that is the vision that's been presented out there uh, on the internet for development of the adjacent property. And uh, you are correct, the adjacent property does have a larger area when it's combined with the existing uh, Little Dolphin Marketplace property. And uh, there are uh, a fair amount of ideas for a uh, number of buildings on that particular site. Uh, if you look closely, one of the things that we wanted to point out by sort of putting everything in context is points of access. We have a point of access off of Little Dolphin Drive, which generally aligns opposite the main entrance proposed as part of this concept plan. In addition, our access off of the access road uh, is very close to a secondary access that's proposed as part of that plan too. And with our site plan or that one, there's an opportunity to make some adjustments and fine tuning as the site plan goes forward so that we could align the entrances, so that we could do from a traffic management and access <coughs> management standpoint, I think a good job in creating not only something that works for this project, but something that will be beneficial <coughs> in the future. We have no idea on timing, we have no idea on ultimate plan, but um, it does appear reasonable that the points of access that we've shown can integrate into uh, effective use of the adjacent property. We are sensitive to the fact that you have asked us to look at coordination, especially um, with the adjacent Dimitri site, uh, to look at shared access. And we'll, we'll open that dialogue um, with you, Butter. We don't own or control the property, so we can't commit to anything uh, with regard to that. But a couple of things to keep in mind. The entrance that we do have proposed does align with what is proposed as a main uh, access point to the Dolphin Marketplace site. In addition, I believe that the entrance that's for the Dimitri site also has uh, access to the rear of their site for deliveries. So anything that's shared or anything that's used really has to be looked at in the sort of global perspective uh, as to what uh, would need to happen there. So as I mentioned, this program, this, this site is a piece of a much larger puzzle. We're very excited about the fact that uh, this can come in and bring opportunities for people to really use the businesses and facilities that are already in place and have already been established in the Oak Hill area. So we're back to deliberations if you have any questions. All right. Thank you. What? Yeah. <coughs> I'm going to get some things to clarify in my mind. First of all, I'm a proponent of the project, so let me go on record as that. But here are some of my questions. First of all, the tenant that you have for the proposed phase one, they're going to take 10,000 or 20,000 square feet. The building is two stories for a total of 20,000 square feet. And are they going to occupy the entire 20,000? That is correct. Okay, that's one thing I didn't have clear in my mind. Second, the, the big picture now, see that's what concerns me, that we, we have a coordinated effort between the Risperas and the other party as far as uh, when they go ahead and complete their marketing plan, whatever that may happen to be, is that it fits in the scheme of things and <coughs> coordinates with the building that's proposed in front of us tonight. Uh, th that, that's my concern. That, that uh, In other words, if this were a project unto itself, there was nothing else going to go on and so forth, I'd have very few questions because I like the concept and I like the ideas of what's been proposed. I certainly like the connection between the uh, 
uh, a little dolphin road and the Foley road and, and, and making that one. Of course, I have a lot of questions about the specifics of sidewalks, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, pedestrian. But in, in my own mind, I like the concept. My concern is what happens after this building is, is built going forward. Well, I can answer part of that. <laughs> Go ahead. This project, in and of itself, by its size, would not trigger the need for the plan development review we're going through, as you know, because of the building size. I believe that that project will require the same level of review, starting with site inventory, master planning, all those different types of things as part of any program of development on that site. So we look at this as we want to do a good job. We want to set the stage. We want to be able to uh, think things out, work things out, look not only for now but in the future. The applicants own adjacent property to this, and they don't want to do anything that's going to have an adverse effect on their properties in the future as well. So I understand your concern. I believe that the process that's already in place will help to alleviate some of those concerns. And of course, uh, reading the material and hearing your, your comments tonight, there are various entities that still have to be contacted. Even though it's only 6,100 square feet of wetland that's going to be uprooted, DEP still has to be involved. Right. We haven't, uh, this is master plan, and yeah. we've got the whole, whole site plan review, design, formal design, state level review, that all that has to go as well. Okay. Based on that, uh, like I said, I'm a proponent, but I want to hear the specifics when we go to the next phase. Absolutely. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Jeff? Um, you're going to build phase one initially and then wait and build phase two at a later date. Any idea how far out that later building will be built? It's anticipated that the second building would come online within five years. So you need to come back to us then, or would it be preliminary approved at that point, at this point? I believe well, what they'll be looking for after master plan is site plan approval for the entire program. So phase one and two in the parking, but would only build phase one in the parking needed for phase one. Um, and then, of course, they can build it two years from now if it's needed or five years from now based on the planning board's approval if you approve it in that manner. That's correct. So with the site plan, we would approve the whole process, even though the building in stages. Correct. Correct. Um, you know, I mean, based on this portion of it, I think that the building is placed, after looking at the other processes, I think the building is probably placed in the best location at this point. I mean, you have landscaping, but we're going to deal with landscaping later on. It's basically where the building is, what you have in place, and what you're looking towards the future. And that's what we're here to take a look at tonight. So I, I like this concept the best. I think when we get into site plan, we need to take a, a harder look at landscaping. But um, I think it makes sense. I, it doesn't give a sea of parking. Um, you've got that broken up. You've got access all the way around from different entities to get in and out of the building. So at this step of the process that we're looking at, I don't have a concern with it, Nancy. Thank you. Corey? Thanks. Um, Nancy, you've noted uh, and pointed out that, the, that architecturally the idea is that there will not be a front elevation versus a rear elevation. Correct. Is there any sense, based on discussions with the future tenant, of sort of whether there will be a functional front or rear? In other words, what would, in terms of how it will be how the signage will be set up and other sort of functional elements <coughs> might also relate to parking in terms of what what they would consider the the front entrance of the building. The prospective tenants are in sort of their building programming phase right now. Um, they haven't really identified specific places where everything goes within the building. By necessity, there's going to have to be some sort of utility type side to the building. We envision that that would be one of the shorter sides and that the very important facades would remain as uh, is or that there would be certain elements 
in the architecture that would help to screen them. Um, mm -hmm. So those types of things. As far as signage, wayfinding, that, that I think that hasn't really been defined mm -hmm. at this point, uh, but that's something that as part of the site plan review process, we would have all of that uh, ironed out. Okay. Yeah, and obviously as, as, as with uh, things like sidewalks and lighting and other things that have been noted, those, those <coughs> are things we get a bite at on uh, during site plan review. I just wanted to have a sense of, of how, uh, how much of a blank slate it will be going forward because that does relate somewhat to the overall configuration of the building, sort of how flexible that is. Um, the, I, I notice a, uh, a proposed future sidewalk connection to, to Hannaford. Is that just purely conceptual at this point or have there been any discussions with, with them about that? We haven't had any discussions with them about that. Um, as I mentioned, that would be part of the second phase. And the access along Foley Farm Road, there is no sidewalk there now. Then out there, there is a sidewalk along Hannaford Drive, and there are sidewalks and crosswalks that connect with the storefront at Hannaford and the adjacent bank. Mm -hmm. And so how that all works out, that's really more that we need to, to detail out as part of a detailed design of Foley Farm Road and how everything connects. But the vision is that once that second phase is built, that people will have a clear opportunity to get to some of the other uses in the mm -hmm. existing sidewalk network that's out there. And I think it's fair to say that, that I think given that it's TVC and everything else and the emphasis that you place in the application materials on, you know, the, the role of this property in bringing people into the different areas and hopefully creating a little bit more of that village type walkable feel. I think that's having a well articulated internal and and external sidewalk network plan will be really critical when we get to that to that stage, as will landscaping and some of these other things. Um, but given all that, um, I think you know going back to the, the last meeting when when there was some discussion, you know, was, this is a little bit of an atypical sequence, <coughs> obviously, in that we sort of had a sketch sketch review type discussion last time. Um, so. Some of us have had a little bit of a head start on this uh, to some extent. I do appreciate seeing some of the examples of the evolution um, of, of the, the, the placement of the building and buildings, as the case may be. Um, and, it, and as we talked about last time, it's, it's obviously kind of tricky geometry and it's a unique situation in that you have the multiple street frontages. Um, but I appreciate that that effort and, and, and those illustrations. And I think, um, you know, as Jeff noted, I, I think it's it's uh, a positive that we don't have a sea of one unbroken sea of parking, as was noted in your write-up. Uh, folks walking in, as, as is designed now, only need to walk across one, one section of parking at most. Um, I think given the fact that um, there seems to be a commitment to really giving equal treatment to the architectural details on each facade and the fact that we do have, you know, we're, we do have two stories here, so it's giving that vertical mass, which is one of the goals of the TVC as well. Um, I think given that and with the caveat that there are a lot more details to, to look at during site plan review on circulation and, and some of those other details, um, I think I'm okay with this overall configuration. Thanks. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Uh, I really like the design of the buildings. Uh, and I like the idea of the atrium connecting the two buildings. Uh, also, the, the way it's going to look both from Route 1 and the access room. Uh, I think you did a nice job with that. Thank you. My only concern at this point is the road cuts. As you mentioned, uh, one of your road cuts is very close to the one for Dimitri's. Um, and I'm thinking down the road when the adjacent parcel gets uh, developed, they're going to have two, three, or I don't know how many road cuts. The traffic on Little Dolphin Way is really going to increase. Uh, it could get very busy. 
Uh, I wonder if, uh, I wonder what your thoughts would be on eliminating that road cut on Little Dolphin and either going with one on the access road or adding a second one. Well, as we've shown on the plan, we would like to be able to maintain um, the access on Little Dolphin as well as the access road. The benefit to that particular layout uh, is the opportunity that we have the majority of parking, if you will, on the site is in that area. So having a secondary means of getting in and out through that area uh, is something that would be a benefit with the, with the second entrance. Uh, as I mentioned, we would open the dialogue with the abutter to talk about you know, proper placement, whether there's an opportunity to do something shared. But we don't own that and we don't control that. But we'll certainly you know, investigate that further. And I think what we really need to also look at is, if you look at that sort of master plan overview, which I can put that up here. I mentioned this is just what's in the marketing materials, but if you look now, you'll see that our point of access is aligned opposite where they envision there would be a, a major entrance to that site. So I really think that access management and control in the bigger picture is definitely, you know, of value uh, and is something that we can discuss further as we move through the, the site plan review process. But um, we feel that we've put them in logical spots. We tried to keep them away from the intersection with the access drive and Foley Farm Road, away from the intersection with the access drive and Little Dolphin Drive. And we've met the ordinance standards for separation distance from the property line uh, adjacent to Dimitri's. It's just that Dimitri's has theirs right there as well. Uh, so we'd like to, like to be able to maintain it, but we'd certainly you know, look at master planning in that particular aspect as well. Okay. Um, I have a question for staff. Uh, if, if they develop this with these road cuts as planned, will, will that restrict or confine the, uh, the adjacent lot as to where they can put their road cuts? The adjacent being this little dolphin uh, potential? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it, it certainly would influence um, where their curb cut would go, certainly in terms of if it's not going to be aligned right across the street to create a four-way intersection, then the, uh, the site plan review ordinance would dictate that it should be uh, adequate separation away so that there aren't turning conflicts and, and that it's offset a little bit. So, um, so they, would, may, they may or may not have options. They're going to have options, but it's going to influence their design. Um, but of course, that's a marketing plan, as has been highlighted in, in this applicant before you now with a, um, a viable project. So um, I wouldn't necessarily give that um, too much standing. Um, perhaps more importantly would be how does the Dimitri's driveway interact with this one? Um, and if, if that, I think if there's concern, if, um, that should be a higher concern than a potential future access to the project uh, adjacent. And you, you mentioned you you have been in conversations with them? I believe the applicants had some initial conversations, perhaps not the specifics um, of the, the comments that we've heard tonight, but um, they have had an, a, there's a dialogue open with regard to access in that area. But one of the things that I did want to sort of follow up on your question about adverse effects, if you will, on the adjacent property, one of the things that that um, sort of composite plan doesn't really show is that there is an opportunity to align immediately with the access drive uh, so that a main entrance into that piece of property and some other conceptual plan may be at an intersection location with the proposed access drive, which accesses the point sort of at the midpoint of the property, which has its benefits. With our alignment as, as we have it shown here, sort of on the end of the property, we're staying as far away as we can from the access drive maximizing our separation distance from that intersection so they could have an intersection there in the future. In addition, it does align on the edge of where they are planning uh, to do uh, some development. So 
I think either way, I think we, we have a good spot for it uh, in this location. If we were to eliminate it or try to consolidate with Dimitri's, we may then not be in a good spot because then we would be offset from a location, as you see on that plan, where they'd want to have their main entrance. So I think we just need to sort of talk a little more globally among the parties. Okay. Thank you. I'm all set. All right. Thank you. John? No. Only comment. I like what you've done. It's very thoughtful. No question. And your insight, Mr. McGee. Uh, I like the project idea. Um, I think there'll be more questions as we move further along the process, some of the sure. more specific details. However, initially, it's, it's very nice. All right. Thanks. I have a few questions, Nancy. You knew I would, didn't of you? You knew <laughs> I would. Um, questions and some comments, actually, more than anything else, and, and some of it may or may not actually um, be totally associated with a master plan approval, but possibly depending upon the answers. Um, in one of the 18 iterations you did on building placements, did you did one of them include an angled placement so that one building was along Foley Farm Road and one building was along Access Road? So the L-shaped building? Kind of an L-shaped. And I realize what that does to the parking, but I'm looking at, number one, trying to get the buildings closer to the street if we can and understanding mm -hmm. that if we do that, that the, you know, you, you give up one thing for the other. But the L shape also assists in minimizing the distance people would travel from the parking field to the buildings. I understand your comment. Um, with regard to this particular building, obviously this is a very much a linear building. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I believe that one of the concepts that we did look at was an L shaped building. If you saw on one of the slides, we did have a a sort of an L that worked with the angle on the property line. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that we run up against mm -hmm. is that to get any sort of massing with the building to be able to have access, et cetera, the ends of the property are constricted. You know, the widest part of the property is really in the middle. And so yep. to try to put a building, meet all the setbacks, and get around the building is a challenge. And then to have the parking be efficient is another challenge. Uh, so those are the types of things that we ran up against. We, we really don't have much for parallel and perpendicular uh, on this site, and you know, we tried to do what we could to optimize uh, what we had uh, on the property. Yeah. I'm just... <clears throat> are you thinking on the Foley Farm Road corner? Yeah. That's what I was kind of thinking, like if on the Foley Farm Road and the, and the Access Road corners, if maybe the buildings were to meet up there. Because um, quite honestly, I know that you, you know, you've talked a lot about visibility from Route 1 and some of these other things. And um, at, the, at the risk of being maybe a little offensive to some of the people in the audience, sorry, Rocky. Um, what that building looking towards Route 1 isn't exactly looking upon a really pretty site, okay? So from that angle, there's, there's trucks, there's trailers, <laughs> there's, you know, I, I'm just saying, I, I drive by that building a lot, I know what's parked in the back, and it's like it's not the most beautiful looking thing. We recognize the fact that our days are numbered. Okay. It's like... Uh, you know, truthfully, um, you know, our operation is not going to be able to continue to do uh, what it does today on Route 1, uh, and that's a discussion we've had with our tenants, and we can't, you know, we can't have our trucks and trailers and whatnot there. Our, our, what we envision is we probably would live till spring, you know, in that location, and then we're going to need to find another home for some of that equipment. Our offices would stay, our, our shop could stay, but keeping equipment and whatnot there that it's just, just not going to work. Okay. Well, um, I mean, and to me, it's not a real, not the best selling not point. The best, it's not the best selling point. Yeah. Another uh, long term, um, just to be clear, my brothers and I do not <coughs> own the property that we occupy on Route 1. It's owned by my parents. Uh, but we do have some 
influence and control over, over that. So our long-term plans were that existing building that's there probably isn't going to be there forever. It's probably not going to be the highest and best use. As this whole area develops out, that piece is going to become more valuable than what, what its current use is. Sure. I, I, I can understand that. I can understand that. I would just, <laughs> in, in terms of positioning the building, and this is the master plan, so what if we say yay to this, then that kind of like is okay. We're saying, yeah, put it there, and you know that's where it stays. So, in terms of planning and perspective, I just wanted to try to see a, the big picture here. Well, we've we've looked at a much larger picture. Yeah, uh, and and we think that this is the right place for the building, uh, especially long term. Well, I can appreciate if you're thinking in that direction, and we'll leave it at that, that I understand and uh, appreciate what you're trying to do. So, and, and again, long term, you know, as we look at uh, abutting sites or adjacent sites, you know, what, what are you going to see, what are you not going to see? Because quite honestly, I mean, you're looking at, un and unfortunately, I should say, you're looking at the backs of a lot of buildings. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the back of Hannaford. You're looking at the back of your property. You're looking at the back of the Little Dolphin property. So right now you're looking at the backs of a lot of buildings. Um, and, is, you know, that is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's why in, in terms of <coughs> visually I was trying to understand the site and what would, if anything, would be the best way to orient the buildings because of that visibility mm -hmm. yeah. visibility function. Based on what you say, what does the tenant think of all that? Based on they're going to be looking at this and that and that. Um, if things went right long term, uh, this particular tenant could could maybe eventually build into the site and head towards Route One. That's what we're talking about—a kind of a campus setting there. Eventually, they could have more buildings, um, or like buildings could be developed over time whether it be the same tenant or not, uh, the same style building could, could be continued. Um, and you're right, we do have some backs of the buildings that, you know, screening and buffering is about all we can, can do to deal with that. But, uh, you know, the buildings that we're proposing tonight basically doesn't have a front or back. It's, you know, it's, it's the same. Yep. No, I understand, and that's why I think when we get into actual site plan, we need to talk more about how we want to screen, even if it's temporary. Mm -hmm. kind of things, or access to different properties. That's why I say, depending, <laughs> depending upon the answer to one question, it could lead into other things that would impact, mm -hmm. um, you know, other other co uh, questions or concepts about sites. This, um, this site is, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's exciting because it's the first one coming to you in this area. Right. But we've got, you know, we're kind of wearing some handcuffs with things that are already there. So it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, it's going to take some patience. Uh, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen with, with the Briar site, the Little Dolphin site. We know publicly what he's, you know, what he's advertised. Maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. We know what we want to do with our site. We have uh, contractual obligations between us to provide utilities not only to our site but to his site uh, and the Foley site. So, uh, the, you know, the Briar site is going to develop out Yes, we may be making some decisions tonight and over the next few meetings that may impact him. That's just part of the way it goes. Um, you know, we're, we're here first, ready, willing, and able, and, and we want to make this fit as best we can, uh, and obviously you know, with as much thinking uh, as to what he's going to do, but right. who knows what could happen there. But Rocky, there are, the tenants you have in, in, on hand right now, they're okay with the placement of the building? Yes. Have you done anything traffic-wise, and I'm, I guess where I'm heading with this, Nancy, is uh, controlled access on the end of Little Dolphin Drive in Route 1? Has that been talked about? or As in a signal? Yes. Um, Bill Bray is our traffic engineer. He's in just in the works of getting the traffic study underway. Our preliminary discussions with him based on the anticipated use and building size uh, would be that we do not trigger the need for a traffic movement permit at the state level. 
Okay. That's not to say that as whatever health, uh, whatever else happens on the the other side Down of the, the site, road could. something might trigger a need yep. for a signal there. But we don't anticipate that we're at that level with our particular use, especially since we do have the alternative means of access for the site. So not everybody has to come out Little Dolphin Drive. That people are going to find their best way home. They're going to find their best way, most efficient way to get to the site as well. Uh, and we have opportunities, which is something that the site didn't originally have. Yep. No. Understood. Understood. Uh, ha have you there on the master plan that you're looking at? And I know that we're not. It, it is not intended to be overly detailed, but in terms of internal pedestrian. Uh, Traffic. Have you identified where you might do something internally in terms of either walkways from area to area, or so I'm looking more not. Uh, I'm not looking for crosswalk information. <coughs> I'm looking more for sidewalk information. Yep. Um, the there is sidewalks along. If you look at what would be the northerly face of the building, there's a sidewalk along the entire face of that building. Um, we do envision that there would be a crosswalk uh, across the access and then tying into Little Dolphin mm -hmm. in that location. Uh, on the southerly face of the building, uh, there is a sidewalk that would extend from basically the atrium area westerly along the edge of the parking lot and would extend out to Foley Farm Road and ultimately out um, to, to um, Hannaford area. Okay. Um, as far as additional sidewalks, it's really going to be a function of where those might end up being, crosswalk locations, those types of things, depending on what else happens in the rest of the project. You really right. don't want to put a sidewalk that's pointing to an, you know, an inappropriate location. Looking at anchor buildings on that site, those are the types of things that you need to look at uh, as part of the program. But we would internally uh, be doing everything that we need to do uh, to accommodate our pedestrians in the site. And in talking with the tenant, uh, the tenant is pretty excited about the pedestrian opportunities and that you know, as things begin to grow and move forward in the immediate area, that their employees are going to be walking to those businesses. That you know, as the employees are there and they want to grab a bite to eat or you know, just take a nice stroll through the road areas, that there's an opportunity to do that. Okay. Um, and just a couple of comments. I realize, again, that this maybe is for future down the road stuff, but um, I know that you've talked about um, good, kind of run out of power, that's all right. I need a, a power supply. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so as you're looking at some of the stormwater management stuff, I would really love to see some of the new green technologies. You talked about the soil being real appropriate. Yeah. Maybe we can do something with either porous pavement or um, stormwater management through our landscaping fields, our landscaping beds. I, I'd like you to hopefully maybe be a little creative and green there. Absolutely. Um, One of the things that I envision for this site, sorry for the that's okay. interruption here. Marvels of modern technology. <laughs> the issue of stormwater treatment, one of the things that we really envision for this site is either the use of grass under drain soil filters, which would effectively look like a lawn area, depressional area. One of the, the benefits of this type of a layout is that there isn't a long distance to travel over pavement before you can get to some sort of treatment device. By doing that, it allows those devices to fit better into the landform so you don't get this huge concentrated area. Yep. So those are the types of things that we're looking at. Also, uh, bioretention cells, not necessarily rain gardens because those are sort of a smaller scale, but the bioretention cells where the areas are specifically planted with uh, vegetation that's able to handle the changes in the uh, water supply, if you will. Yep. So those are the types of things that we envision for that site. Okay. Well, again, I mean, I, I understanding what we're trying to do here in master plan, I'm just seeing that there's going to be some challenges when we start to look at stuff like 
um, snow removal, snow placement. You're going to have some issues there that you're going to have to be dealing with uh, um, in a layout of this type. So, One of the things we did want to mention about that um, with regard to snow removal is we do anticipate that snow would be removed um, from this site because we do have a pretty pretty tight layout in. Yeah. It's not a situation where the parking demand changes seasonally and so we're not going to have the luxuries we might have on some other sites where you could have a stockpile area okay. that would be removed. All right. Um, does, does the board have any other questions in terms of master plan, master plan layout? Are they comfortable with what you're seeing and that we're going to end up with something that we want at the end of the day? Yeah, I've seen a lot of nodding heads here. So uh, I think from a master plan perspective, then the board is comfortable. Oh, hang on. That's just a There's one thing I have yet to do, and I apologize. Uh, there is an opportunity for public comment. If there is anybody <coughs> here from the public who would like to comment about what they've seen or heard this evening, you have the opportunity to approach the podium and make your comments, and we want to give you the opportunity to do that now. If you want to do that, please state your name and address for the record. make a couple of comments. One, wow. Uh, this comes close to a long, long dream I've had <laughs> about where our land is situated, right between Maple Avenue and 114. Uh, I owe, we have enough land to go from Maple Avenue through to the sidewalks on Hannaford Drive. And it was always my dream that someday there would be a walkway that would come from Maple Ave through there, hook up with Hannaford sidewalk, and then the real part of the dream, a pedestrian overpass over 114 so that all of that would be connected with foot traffic. This has some potential to get that way. Uh, so that's my first comment. I don't have any problem with Risberra's our project at this point. It looks good to me. I do have some doubts about uh, Little Dolphin, but that is something that will have to be addressed later on, particularly water. Uh, it seems to me that uh, on the Risbera project, they have addressed a lot of the water issues. We're downhill, our house, most of our land is downhill from uh, where these proposed developments are going. And right now, I know that uh, a ditch has been constructed from uphill straight down the hill uh, and dumps out uh, about 10 feet from our property line. Uh, I didn't like that because there was no uh, talk between the property owner and and uh, and, and us. Uh, Probably it's perfectly legal, I don't know. But it's not one of those things that you like to see people do. Other than that, I don't have any problems with any of it. It looks good to me, and I, and I hope they go ahead with it. We appreciate your comments. Anyone else? <coughs> Please. Mr. Chairman, I'm Bill McKenney with Hannaford uh, Brothers. I work in the real estate department. And uh, I would ask the planning board before it further considers this application uh, to have the town planner confirm that the applicant has right title and interest in uh, Foley Farm Road for uh, their proposed access to the site. Uh, and it uh, sounds like this is just the master plan phase, uh, but when you get into site plan review, we'd like to take a look at the traffic numbers to ensure that there's safe access along Hannaford Drive um, between our shopping center and, and uh, Route 1. So we certainly uh, support uh, our neighbors developing uh, their properties uh, as long as they show that they have right title and interest and as long as uh, safe and convenient access to existing businesses in the area uh, is maintained. Thank you. Okay. And we appreciate your comments. You. What, what leads you to believe they don't? 
we're, we're just asking that the uh, uh, plan or confirm that right title and interest is provided. I think that's part of the, the application yeah, that's process. That's part of the process. So okay. we, we, would, we would do that as part of the process. <coughs> I just heard some doubt, that's yeah. all. If, if I could, would you be so kind as to spell your last name for us? Sure, M C capital K E N N E Y. Thank you. Make sure we get it right for the record, that's all. Um, and again, thank you. We do appreciate your comments, and we will definitely be doing that um, as in terms of um, the, the rights to be able to do that. That is part of the standard uh, process that they would need to go through um, and provide us and certainly from a, I, I have to believe that we're going to get some traffic interest um, and comments as we go through this approval process. So we'll be looking at that uh, for sure. So I feel comfortable in saying that. We'll do the due diligence on that item as well. Any other comments from the board or, or excuse me, any other uh, comments from the public? No, seeing none. Okay. Any other comments from the applicant? Just ready to answer any questions. Okay. Ready to answer questions. I think our questions are completed. Um, and I think to the satisfaction of the board, I would say as well at this point from a master planning perspective. So. I would like to approve the master plan for the Rosbera Family Development LLC, including the building, location, setbacks, and square footage, and find it consistent with the site inventory and analysis. Is there a second? I'll second. Do we have a second? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? I show that to be unanimous, and Thank we will move much. forward with the process. Our next item this evening, item number six, Waterstone Retail requests a sketch plan review for lot seven at 700 Gallery Boulevard. Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is, um, application is perhaps a bit unusual um, before the board in that this is a project before you for sketch plan review as the applicant for lot seven on Scarborough Gallery. Um, actually wants to start clearing and preloading the site for future construction. Um, some adjacent lots in Scarborough Gallery, uh, the Walmart, the Lowe's, had quite long um, preload processes um, prior to construction of large buildings and the building footprint. Um, given the soils in the area, given um, some of those challenges with those two projects, um, the, the applicant and the staff that have had some discussions and we want to be um, pretty detailed about this process um, to ensure that the right approach is taken with the preload um, and also um, want to have the planning board um, kind of weigh in on a sketch plan level on the, the building location, at least for the, the large building footprint where they're seeking the preload. Um, I think the applicant would like to start the preload before any uh, state and local approvals on the project, given it's probably a, a 10 to 12 month process. So if they can um, get some feedback from the board this evening on the, the location of um, the large multi-tenant retail building and get some concurrence on that location and they can proceed with prepping the site for construction and preloading and then continue the detailed site plan review process with the board. Um, so, in light of that, um, staff has reviewed um, the sketch plan, and we've also had Peter Tubbs of Site Designs review the, the approach to preloading and erosion control and monitoring and all those things. Um, site, di site Design uh, has a memo for you, and they're um, comfortable with documentation and the approach, uh, I think with a question that I assume Nancy's prepared to answer on um, precautions to make sure the adjacent stormwater pond's not impacted by the preload. Um, other than that, staff's primary comment is on the site plan layout is 
um, that driveway that's proposed to come in across from the, the, the Lowe's driveway closer to Muzzy Road. Um, from a design standpoint, there's not a lot of throat to that driveway, meaning a lot of distance from that driveway to the edge of the building and the side of the building. Um, that could be a, a primary access, even though it's shown as a primarily a truck access point. So um, the board might want to talk about with the applicant whether there's enough room there for queuing and proper maneuvering, or if um, perhaps the length of that building is lessened a little bit by moving a smaller tenant to an outbuilding, just lessening the overall length of the building. That's one approach, um, and I'm sure there are other approaches. So. Uh, with that introduction, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Nancy, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Nancy St. Clair, St. Clair Associates. I have tonight with me two gentlemen uh, representing Waterstone Retail, Doug Richardson in the white shirt in the back, uh, is with Waterstone Retail, and Frank Quigley in the yellow shirt is uh, their construction manager. Frank has been actively and intimately involved in uh, the preload and surcharge plan and will be the one sort of taking it through the first phase of the, the construction process. As Dan mentioned, we're sort of in a, a relatively unique position in that we are asking for uh, the opportunity to preload and surcharge the site to prepare the site for future development. But that preparation process is expected to take about a year. And so what we're here tonight is sort of to give you folks an overview uh, as to what's proposed as part of the preload and surcharge plan, and then to talk a little bit about the aspects of the project as it's anticipated to come forward with the site plan review with you folks. In the year period when the, the compressible soils on the site are settling and doing what they're supposed to do, we envision that we will be working with you folks uh, to formalize the site plan design. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a history of this project. I've been involved in this project since the original zone change back in 2002. Um, this has been a long, <laughs> long evolutionary process, but one that's been very exciting and, um, as you see, it's a very, very well used uh, area uh, as part of the community. But in that process, um, lot 7 is really the last remaining largest undeveloped lot uh, in the Scarborough Gallery subdivision. Back when Scarborough Gallery was originally approved and went to construction in 2005, uh, there was a, it wasn't a master planning and review process per se, um, as it was called, you know, sort of what you have in the ordinance now, but the Economic Development Overlay District uh, was applicable at the time of the original review. So a lot of the things that are looked at as part of the master planning process now in this district were addressed back in the original design uh, and approval through uh, your board in 2005. And I'm not sure if anybody's still on the board that was... Yeah, Carol, you and I. <laughs> That's it. Um, but anyway, <coughs> as part of that process, architectural elements, unified design, uh, the tree-lined boulevard, all of those pieces were part of that unified approach to uh, designing a program for this large area, it's about 89 acres, uh, that um, allowed the development to move forward and really create a, a location uh, for the, the businesses that are there. So as I mentioned, Lot 7 is the last remaining uh, largest undeveloped piece the other lot that um, hasn't been developed is actually lot six. It's on the corner of Muzzy Road and Gallery Boulevard. You'll see that small house that's for sale. That's really the only piece of that lot um, that is of anything of use and is not intended to be part of this project. The majority of lot six is in a conservation easement uh, and is set aside. There's a conservation easement on this piece of property as well. It provides um, that sort of green area you'll see on the plan that goes from the rear of the development site all the way out to Muzzy Road. That was set aside as part of a compensation program that also included 58 acres on the Nonsuch River uh, off of Honeywell Hill. Uh, so there's a sort of a whole host of history uh, that goes with this piece of property. The uh, existing facilities that are on this piece of property that uh, Peter Tubbs mentioned in his uh, comment letter are a storm drain line that runs from Gallery Boulevard to the pond that you see in blue uh, on the, sort of the lower end of the site. 
that's a stormwater management pond. It's a wet pond uh, that was part of the master plan for stormwater for the overall project. So that drain line, large diameter drain line, uh, runs down along the westerly side of this property in an easement benefiting the town, um, and it goes to the detention area. And one of the questions that Peter Tufts had is how have you accommodated or addressed this as part of the preload and surcharge, concerned particularly about uh, any uh, effects on that line in the pond area. Uh, SW Cole has done the geotechnical evaluation of this site. They uh, have relied on new borings that they've done as part of their evaluation of the site, as well as other borings that have been done uh, throughout the past on this piece of property and sort of culminated all the information together. And as part of that, they are well aware of the storm drain line that runs along the property, as well as the wet pond and the depth below uh, the water surface elevation in order to make sure that um, looking at the, the surcharge materials that will be on there, uh, what proper instrumentation needs to be in place during uh, the preload to monitor uh, movement of soils uh, on the site. and so. That's definitely something that we're all sensitive to and definitely something that has been already included uh, in as part of the evaluation. That evaluation, the geotechnical evaluation, looks at how high to place the surcharge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So before we kind of get into to more of the details on that, one of the things that I did sort of want to give is sort of an overview. Uh, in your narrative packets there, you sort of see a step-by-step -step process um, as to how a preload and surcharge will work. But basically, we've identified an area where um, in the footprint of the major buildings on the site, that's where the, the clays that are on the property need to be consolidated, pre-consolidated. Basically, clay has a memory. And if you over-consolidate it, then it's not going to settle as much post-construction so you don't get cracking in buildings and those types of things. So that's all part of the, the program um, that uh, is happening it's in order to help facilitate that settlement. Wick drains, which I'm not sure if you've all seen wick drains, but basically they're, um, well, they look like a, like a wick from a, much larger, but a wick from a kerosene lantern. And they're drilled into the ground. They're punched in, basically a, like a giant sewing machine. <laughs> and they're placed into the soil. And they're placed at depths in order to help remove the water from the clays. So once the site is prepped for the preload and surcharge, the first layer that goes down is sand. And so when the water comes up through the wick drains, it's able to gently come out over the sand and down and out of the site. From that point on, you need weight. And so what we have looked at is a sort of a, a piece of the pie situation, if you will, in that the first layers that go on on top of that sand layer would be structural fill materials that would stay in place that would remain underneath the building and provide a good support for the building. As you move up in that cross section, you're going to get to a point where you're going to be higher than the footprint of the building in order to provide that weight. At that point, you're going to be putting in materials that would be part of the on-site gravels for construction of the parking lot. At the next slice of the pie, the next layer that goes up, you're in common borrow materials. And those are the materials that would go into the general fill area to provide the necessary platform once the um, site construction happens. So basically, it's a flop, as the <laughs> geotechnical engineer uh, describes it, so that the materials that are brought into the site, the vision is that those materials would be able to be reused on the site as part of the fills in just the reverse order of what they were placed. So that's sort of the, the preload and surcharge in a nutshell. <laughs> what we're proposing to do. Uh, in order to not sort of disrupt the entire site while this is happening is we have uh, identified very specific areas where uh, clearing will be happening and areas where clearing and grubbing will be happening, which will be different. Uh, areas where it will be preloaded and surcharged will be cleared and grubbed. So you don't want any of the organic materials in that cross section. So that comes out, the stumps and all that come out. We envision that the use of those materials will be for erosion control mix to help um, stabilize the site during construction. The areas outside of the footprint of this preload and surcharge would be cut in order to allow for effective maneuvering, but not stumped. And the reason for that 
is that that microterrain, anything that comes off from runoff from that area, will help to get collected in the microterrain in that area and provide some treatment for, for stormwater before leaving the site. The remainder of the area would be left in its natural state and would not be uh, disturbed until full construction happens. So we do need to have two means of access simply because as the preload uh, does get uh, up there, we'll need to have a secondary means to come in. Uh, so we do have a proposal to show, show you some pictures here. This first photo is the primary entrance. This is actually opposite the Lowe's truck access. So this is the uh, <coughs> driveway that goes into, opposite the driveway that goes into Lowe's closest to Muzzy Road. You'll see there's a yellow arrow on the inset that shows sort of the view. The curb cut's already there. It was placed when, back in 2005 when construction happened on Gallery Boulevard. And you'll see that there's some soils sort of stockpiled in that area. Um, back when Lowe's was built, part of this location was used as a um, stormwater uh, settlement basin um, during construction. So there was some site disturbance that happened when Lowe's was built on this particular lot. So that um, is the view there. As we move further on, the secondary access would be the access that is directly opposite uh, the entrance to Lowe's and to Red Robin. And that would be the secondary means of access and one that would be provided sort of as you get further on, they'd probably be using that more than, than the primary one, which is closest to Muzzy Road. You'll see opposite that access point and sort of that inset, um, there's a little sort of a square area there. That's a staging area. We had shown it out initially at 125 by 125. Some of the contractor comments that we've received back to date are they're concerned that that may not be big enough. So what we'd like to be able to offer is that the contractor could expand that area, provided that he maintained at least a 75-foot wide buffer of existing vegetation around the entire perimeter uh, of that, which would give them a more reasonable area to do some stockpiling. We anticipate that loam that comes off this area um, would be able to be stockpiled there sufficient enough to be able to reuse on the site. It may be a situation where some of that material comes out when the empty trucks are going out to get um, <coughs> more material. But the vision is to be able to have the materials that are on the site useful uh, for sort of the, the next phase, the real construction uh, of the building. This is a view that's sort of looking right into the site. This is right at the curb cut, um, which would be the secondary entrance. It kind of gives you a feel for what the vegetation is like in that area. Um, when the boulevard was built, the clearing extended beyond the limits of pavement, obviously, so you've got some smaller undergrowth that's coming, uh, but you've got some tall sort of leggy growth uh, in the middle of Lot 7. And there are some areas that um, are experiencing experiencing some blowdown. So as part of that, we want to make sure that the contractor is aware and maintains that so we don't have a, a safety hazard for the, anyone working on the site uh, in that area. The next one sort of a, just a zoom in, uh, close-up shot of what it looks like on the site. And uh, we were out there one winter and were quite surprised to see a tent. Um, apparently, there's been some transients that have liked to <laughs> have a little secluded spot there. but. Um, that's sort of the general feel uh, as to what the, the vegetation is like on the site itself. This is the uh, view from the Walmart loading area that actually gives you a shot of the wet pond uh, that's on the site that's shown in blue uh, on the inset. So this is the stormwater management pond that's already in place and was built to handle the runoff coming down from Gallery Boulevard and some of the other lots in the subdivision. As part of the ultimate plan uh, for development of this site, a portion of this site uh, was originally envisioned to be tied into this system, so we'll be looking at that as part of a site plan design. Uh, the remainder of the site would be looked at going to some of the other uh, discharge points on the site as part of the overall master plan. This plan right here uh, is sort of the concept plan that is the, the current marketing plan for this site, very similar to what was proposed and discussed back in the original 2005 reviews, placement of the building generally in line with the <coughs> Walmart building uh, facing oriented uh, in this direction with some satellite buildings along the front. Um, this plan, as we talked in the last presentation, uh, this plan is something that is being used for marketing right now and is subject to further refinement as we go through the review with you folks and look uh, closely in detail, especially um, 
Dan raised a couple of comments on circulation, et cetera, access management, those types of things. But the points of access to Gallery Boulevard have all been defined, have all been built. Uh, so we're not anticipating any changes in that. They were part of an overall master plan. They looked at alignment with um, uses, potentials for, you know, cross connections, those types of things. So for this particular site, there's actually three points of access. Two are on Gallery Boulevard, and the third is part of an agreement and an easement um, that was set aside in the original subdivision design to tie into the entrance to Walmart, Walmart's easterly entrance, which is their primary entrance. Um, so the, this would be their third point of access for the site. So this layout is consistent with what we presented back in 2005. Uh, and we will be going, obviously, through with further refinement with you folks as we go through the, the actual site plan review process. One of the other pieces uh, that Doug has uh, brought with us tonight is uh, some architectural elevations for the building. Certainly, um, we understand and know that the architectural elements that are already in place in that subdivision need to be carried through. That was a big topic of discussion and a big area of focus back when we did the original design. And uh, the applicants are very much sensitive to that. The actual architect that, is, that did these elevations actually did the most recent building in the subdivision, which is on Lot 9, which is on the corner, on the other corner of Walmart, um, where there's a U.S. cellular uh, tenant in that building. So we've got architects that are familiar with the, the process, with the setting, et cetera, and we're certainly sensitive to the requirements that go through. But um, as we mentioned, really what we're here tonight to discuss is the opportunity to really prepare the soils on the site, not to um, get too involved in the, the specific site plan details, but really to you know, discuss with you folks the program, what we anticipate would be necessary to move forward in order to um, have the development move forward. This is a very uh, extensive piece of the overall construction cost. This is something that um, I think has probably pay played a factor in the timing and delay uh, in development of this site. So obviously the economy <laughs> is another piece of it as well. But we are very optimistic that this program can move forward. We're excited about it. And really it's putting the last piece in the, the puzzle and really kind of bringing things all together. But in order to do that, the very first thing that needs to happen is to prepare those soils. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Dave, you want to start us? I really don't have any issues at all. Okay. Yeah. No issues at all. Okay. No issues. Thank you. Corey? Nancy, on the, um, once the material has all been put in place, and I, I know this has been described, uh, went through this on, on the prior phases of the, of the, the, of the uh, complex there in gallery. Once the material is in place, is there any activity during that intervening 10 to 12 month period or that does it have to periodically be maintained or I'm just sort of thinking about the need for for heavy equipment to be accessing the site and things like that. The only, in, the only thing that I would anticipate on equipment being on that site is if as a result of any of the monitoring that has to happen with regard to erosion sediment control, there's an area that needs to be repaired. Other than that, there shouldn't be anything working on that site. It's going <coughs> to be on there that there'll be surveyors and everybody monitoring those sediment platforms, seeing what's happening, reading the instrumentation that's on the site, monitoring what's happening beneath the ground. Um, but once that preload and surcharge is in place, the erosion sediment control measures are put in place and they're intended to be monitored periodically. Uh, the contractor has a mandatory requirement to monitor them every month. If there's anything that needs to be repaired, it has to be repaired immediately. And roughly how long? Uh, do we anticipate that it will take to to prepare the site and put those ten to twelve things months. in place? Well, to to actually put the oh. material on the site physically. Six to eight weeks, probably. Okay. During that time period, um, the contractor will be monitoring at a minimum weekly, or before and after any storm events for erosion sediment control measures, and we'll be keeping an eye on things as well. well I certainly don't have any issues with with that aspect of things, and certainly defer to the technical experts on that. I just make a quick comment on the on the site and um, it's more sketch sketch 
plan review oriented and, and that I would tend to agree with staff's comment about the uh, the entrance to the property that's closest to Muzzy Road that's a pretty short throw and given that um, as you reminded us those access points are fixed per prior approvals um, it seems to me that if that's going to be addressed it would have to be in, in sort of looking at the building footprint and whether that be just generally shortening up the length of the building and or um, uh, as was suggested uh, maybe moving one of the smaller tenants to a more of an outbuilding type location I just look forward to, to seeing how that evolves but I but I would certainly think particularly given that that's or the, the first entrance point that one comes to from Muzzy Road understanding that it could end up being a just a delivery or truck entrance um, that's one thing that does sort of jump out at me going forward we've ha already had discussions about that amongst the team um, certainly Dan's comment was was not a surprise if you will I mean we, we had already discussed that as well um, a couple of things that may end up happening you know I'm not necessarily convinced that reorientation of a smaller tenant to the end of the building from a retail perspective is going to be something that um, would be the preferred approach um, but um, there are certainly other alternatives that we could look at really looking closely at the details of the turning maneuvers looking closely at whether we do restrict that entrance so that it is trucks only um, so that we don't have a, a real focus there and so those are the types of things that we'll be going through as part of the preparation of the site plan to come back to you folks. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you. Yep. So if we give approval tonight, I guess the question to staff, if we give approval tonight to this process, they can start work immediately on the eight week process to clear the site and prep it. Yeah, they don't technically need approval to uh, begin clearing the site and prepping the site and preloading the site. So this is really a um, an opportunity for them to introduce the project and and recommendation on staff's behalf or from staff that they should probably just review the primary building location with you before they spend what I think is going to be a significant investment preloading it just to see if there's any red flags going up by the board saying we don't think generally speaking a building should should be in that location or have any comments about that um, I think they certainly can maybe preload an area a little bit larger than where the building might go or and still be fine so details such as the access way and how long the building is to the last 20 to 50 feet probably isn't a big deal um, but it's really more of a introduction and FYI they're going to they're going to do the preload um, and get any feedback from you initially when you do the preload do you preload the property to the same standard or is it going to be different in in where you might site the building say you decide to change siting of the building is it all going to be the same preload structure or does it vary depending on where you put the buildings Nancy the the preload is necessary under the the main building so any of the satellite buildings and the ones that are sort of closer to Gallery Boulevard they have flexibility because they're lighter structures so the main building is really the one that needs to be preloaded and surcharged and so in looking at the orientation of the building looking at sort of what was done in the past several years placement of the building in this location <coughs> seemed the most reasonable we've got um, you know a whole host of other scenarios that have been evaluated back five or plus years ago <laughs> um, but this one seemed to always come back to the the appropriate for the main buildings now we're not talking about the satellites because in the time frame from the original approval of the subdivision there was a 80 foot front yard setback in this district when the subdivision was approved and that's obviously changed quite a bit now uh, with the current ordinance standards so for those satellite buildings we'd be looking very much at trying to make sure we can be in keeping with the current zoning for that but for this particular building for the main building we're pretty confident that this is in its most logical position and would you look to start work on the site immediately in the next few weeks or for the preload and surcharge yes um, we'd be looking to try to get going as, as best we can because we'd like to be able to get everything in and settling over the winter so that by the time we get into the fall of next year that you know, we're really really ready to 
go forward with real construction on the site. And that gives us time to spend time with you folks uh, and to go through the review process. did want to clarify one thing um, Dan had said. There is a permit on this site that was part of the prior permitting from the DEP. So we do have a permit um, for this site. Uh, so we've talked to the DEP and sort of gone through the same processes we're going through with you so that we we'll make sure we're, we're okay to get started doing the preload and surcharge on that end as well. Now will they also, will DEP also monitor the preloading process or is that primarily just up to your client and then they make reports to them? The monitoring of the progress of the preload and surcharge yeah. or the progress of the preload and surcharge is going to be monitored through the geotechnical engineer. Okay. So that the, the settlement and the timing of that, when the material, we estimate it's 10 to 12 months. It could be 10 months, it could be 12 months. We could find out, you know, partway through the process that things are going wonderfully and it, it could be something better or there could be a delay. We don't know. So that monitoring allows us to sort of keep track of the schedule as to what will happen. As far as... You know, I guess my question is, you don't need to report that preloading process to DEP as part of no. the permit process. No. But that's what I was getting oh, at. Sorry. No. Okay, thank you. I'm also Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Huh? Yeah, just a couple of brief comments. First of all, a lot of this has already been pre approved. Um, I, I understand that. It preceded my time on the board. Uh, but I, I, I would stress uh, two, two things. One is the queue when everything is said and done. I know that's a <coughs> concern of staff and in reading over things, I concur with their, you know, feelings. So I want to make sure that we, you know, we have that. And two, even though the gallery is, is what I'll call a mishmash of buildings, I hope in the final analysis that the architecture, you know, is fits into what we're trying to accomplish uh, as far as the overall area is concerned. I just would throw that out. Um, other than that, I don't have any problems. Everything that was on my mind has already been asked and, and answered. So. Curiosity question. How high is the preload on the existing ground? Uh, it's about an 18 foot surcharge. So we're looking at a basically two story mound of dirt. Well, the, oh, site, the site is actually Sorry. lower than Gallery Boulevard. It depends really on where you are on Gallery Boulevard. What you say. <laughs> 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 it could be as low as eight feet. There you go. <laughs> All right. One story. Okay. No, I'm just kind of curious as to you know what's everybody going to be looking at for the next ten to twelve months, right? Well, we're so. certainly we're certainly understanding of that. I mean, there's so, certainly we can't screen the entire area, but as part of the program, we do want to keep some of that. It's a buffer, so you're not looking at that. No, I, I understand that. I, I, I'm just, it was like, it was a curiosity question, and that really was the, what it was meant to be. Uh, I guess my only comment is, uh, I just want to make sure that as you're, you know, going through this process, and, I'm, and I know that you will, but uh, that, that we keep in play um, uh, staffs, um, our, our consultants with, with Peter Tubbs, right? So that we're working with him in terms of his concern about the pipe and we've got all of that and we're taking care of that and we're working together with staff and our review process and peer reviewers and that everybody's in, in, involved. That's all. That's my concern. Um, I, I did obviously review the, the memo that Peter had issued and I also reviewed it with the applicants and I think they'd like us to to pass on a message to you that you know, they're very sensitive to the existing facilities that are on the site, don't want to have any adverse effects as well. So there will be close communication during construction. And if there's anything as part of the instrumentation or anybody's observation <coughs> that is seen as, you know, having to be repaired in that area, then the applicant would be certainly on board to do those repairs and make sure that everything remains as it was originally. No, that's my only concern. Uh, we're just, you know, doing the due dil diligence there for, for for all of us, right? So, cool. Have at it. Thank you very much. Go play in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just hope this doesn't go as long as the Walmart one. Yeah. Hurry up and wait. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get the Tonka trucks out and we'll have a great time. Right? Thank all you. right. The Walmart one. Um,
about. The next item this evening is our administrative amendment report. Mr. Bacon. Since Mr. Chase doesn't have a microphone. Okay. We have no administrative amendments to report, I, Mr. Chairman. I'm not surprised at that. Uh, town planner's report. Um, yeah. Uh, on behalf of the assistant planner, who's um, microphoneless, uh, Wednesday evening, this Wednesday at 6:30, uh, in this room, there's going to be a workshop on preparing for the potential impacts of sea level rise on Scarborough Marsh. Um, and that's something that Jay's been working on in partnership with the Conservation Commission, the Friends of Scarborough Marsh, the Land Trust, and also um, uh, at the state agencies on dealing with that topic. And, and um, Pete Slavinsky of um, Maine Geological um, Survey. So that's something that's occurring at 6.30 um, for the board's awareness as well as the public um, who's using at home. Okay. Thank you. I um, have two more other reports. Uh, one is, as probably many of you noticed, the Dunstan intersection is essentially complete. Um, there's going to continue to be monitoring of how the signals are operating, the coordination, and probably some tweaking that will occur over the next few months and, and perhaps a year. Um, but in certainly in large part, the Dunstan intersection project uh, has been complete, which I've reported to the board on a lot in the past, um, which is a good accomplishment. And um, for the board's awareness, the council passed second reading on the Crossroads District at their last meeting, which was last Wednesday. Um, they did make an amendment to allow for casino uh, gambling in the district, but subject to local voter approval through a local referendum process and also subject to needs to be changes that need to be made at state law uh -huh. <laughs> um, and state and local licensing. So um, that was an amendment. I think that was some of those notions were talked about through the planning board public hearing process. Um, so it's an allowed use in the district with a lot of caveats and a lot of work that would need to be done at other levels of government in addition to local level. So um, those are some updates for the board. All right, thank you. Any planning board comments this evening? I, won't go yes. be, I will not be here at the next meeting. All right, business. Thank, thank you. Down. Dave? I have a question for Dan. <coughs> yes. What is the town planning to do with that corner lot that used to be Scarborough sign? That corner lot, um, the town actually in the spring, there, there was uh, entertained offers for acquisition of that property. There was a potential buyer of the building next door that used to be a doctor's office, and that potential buyer expressed some interest in the corner lot to potentially make that a more viable site for a new use. Um, so at that time, the town did a um, request for proposals and opened up for the public to see if there's any interest um, in acquiring it. Um, that property or that potential buyer expressed some interest, um, but ended up not moving forward with the project. Um, so my long-winded answer is I think the town is open to selling that property to um, the right buyer. Um, it just is going to be a unique buyer given how small it is and um, its location. So. When, wouldn't that be restricted to one buyer? Pretty much. Well, um, there's two adjacent property owners. There's yeah. the Rite Aid, right. and then there's that um, doctor's office or former doctor's office I mentioned. So those are the two likely buyers. Given that on its own, it's not a lot that can have much more than a lemonade stand. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty small uh, market for that lot. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Well, once again, I would indeed like to welcome Mr. McGee. Thank you. Um, we are a jovial group, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> what can I say? Um, we do. We are glad to have 
uh, a complete board again and look forward to uh, your your expertise and um, your um, work on the board. So thank you for volunteering. Um, any other comments? No? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? And that would be Mr. Major is the second. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor? No. I show that to be unanimous and good evening. Yeah.